even though it's very difficult, even though managing the team, you know, getting the robot built, this is a humongous task. But that opportunity is what I think makes your lives really great. Aragon High School hosts a variety of clubs, teams, and after-school groups. One of these is Robotics, a group of high-commitment teams dedicated to inspiring and empowering the next generation through robots. Robotics can be split into six teams, Mate ROV, FTC, FRC, Outreach, Finance, and Marketing each with their own purpose, and each with their own group of highly committed members. This documentary will be focused on how the FRC team built their 2022-2023 robot for the game Charged Up. This is how Team 840 created Sparky. A year in FRC is basically broken down into two seasons. We start off with the off-season, so that's the summer and the fall. And the off-season is spent recruiting and interviewing and onboarding new members. We spend a good 12 weeks in the fall with our training curriculum, training all the new members, freshmen and sophomores, and some juniors, and teach their members all that they need to know. And then starting in January, right off the bat, off of winter break, is when build season starts. And so the company first releases all the information for the, that year's game. After that's released, they basically give you about six to 10 weeks to design, build, and program your bot from scratch. FRC teams typically attend to regional competition for a year, so you go to those regionals, and if you win the regional or if you win a big award, you get to go to world championships in Houston, Texas. And then after the build season ends, the off season starts up again. This year, the game is what we call a pick and place game. The robots have to pick up and place uh, game pieces. This year the game pieces are cones and cubes. They're about the size of like a soccer ball or a beach ball. They have to carry them from one side of the field to the other and place them quite high up, about four feet up and a couple feet across away from their robot. So there are three levels. There's a ground level, a low level, and a high level with increasing point values as you go up. And as is usual with FRC games, you get more points if you score during the autonomous period, which is where the robots are being controlled automatically and you get fewer points when the robots are being controlled in teleop, which is when the drivers are controlling the bot. At the end of the game, there is a place on the field called the charge station, where the robots have to balance on what's effectively a seesaw, and if multiple robots can get on the charge station and have it balanced out, there's more points for that alliance, increasing their chance for winning. Once the game details are released, the team immediately starts meeting multiple times a week for multiple hours of work in order to make process on their robot. However, it starts as nothing more than an idea. It is only through testing and research that these ideas are polished into plans by the design team. So what we do is we come up with multiple ideas and over time people will kind of start iterating on those ideas and we start really basic. We want to find like the very basic mechanisms that could work and we prototype on those. So we make physical test dummies of these mechanisms and see if there are actually viable options for what we could put up on the bot. So we can use Takata software such as Onshape, maybe Fusion, we kind of map out what these uh, mechanisms will look like over time and eventually uh, we'll use the CAD software to kind of uh, conceptualize what the final robot will look like in the end. And we had different uh, small groups that were working on their own specific prototypes. Then after a week or two, we presented them in, t in front of the entire team. Based on that, everyone voted on which design would be the best. Essentially what we have is a slanted elevator for on our robot. And the reason for that is the scoring station is pretty far away. It's like around four or five feet away. And having our elevator diagonally would allow us to easily like save the amount of length that we have to extend out. The intake was designed to take into account the two game pieces that are found in the game. One of them is a 9.5 by 9.5 inch cube and another one is about 8 and 3 quarters inch uh, tall uh, cone. Based on a lot of prototyping that we've done and a lot of resources that we've read, we found that compliant wheels were a very great option of using on an intake for this year. So a compliant wheel is technically a wheel has a rubbery material like polyurethane. It can compress very easily. So what you can do is have like these compliant wheels on the intake. And since they're, since they're compressible, they're able to kind of take in game pieces that are much larger than the compression levels. And they have really good grip. And they're also really quick at taking in game pieces. Through testing that we've done, we found that 
Uh, these were really good uh, material that we could use for the intake mechanism. So. With the plans and measurements from the design team, the fabrication team builds the robot. Usually it all starts in the computer lab where the amazing design sub team creates a robot in CAD, computer aided design, for us to build physically. They give us drawings of the things they have CADed, they give us measurements, all sorts of useful numbers, letters, materials, and all of that so that we over here can use the very many tools we have to actually build the robot. We have materials like metal, like steel and aluminum. Sometimes we use wood, whether it be plywood or hardwood. And then we also use the tools that we have in the background. The main ones would be the drill, the drill press, the mill, and the chop saw. And there's also a bunch of other tools that we use. So uh, most of the mechanisms that we have, uh, we have built before. However, we are uh, putting like the mechanisms that we already built to different uses. For example, uh, the elevator this year is at a slanted angle as opposed to 2018, uh, which was perpendicular to the ground. We have quite a bit of experience with intakes. So our intake this year is, again, it's not like something that we've built before, but we have built a lot of intakes, so we can use our previous knowledge from that into building this one. The drivetrain is fairly standard. Uh, we also have some experience with that. It's just minor differences from previous years. We also have a four bar linkage this year. We've never actually done that before, uh, but we did have a lot of research go into that um, and it turned out pretty well. At the beginning of the build season, we usually have a schedule set up where we have two to three weeks of prototyping. So we prototyped a bunch of different intake mechanisms before we ended up with the one that's on our bot. We prototyped a bunch of other things like some climbs, some drivetrains, some other bits and pieces, but the intake was the most important part. So that's like the two to three weeks of prototyping. After that, we get into the actual final CADs, final prototypes, final bot that we have. That part can take from five weeks all the way to even more. It, it could be endless if we wanted to make the bot absolutely perfect. But as you said, we do have a deadline. This time we got around an eight week build season. Sometimes the build season can be as short as six. So each year we have to adapt with the time that we have and the resources we have to build the robot for our competition. After a robot has been created physically, it needs to be able to be controlled. While the design and fabrication team focus on creating the physical robot, the programming team creates the software to run it correctly, both with and without an operator. Programming, or coding as you may know it, um, is basically the process of uh, writing the software that actually goes on the physical robot. Uh, every year we make a new uh, code from scratch, specifically designed for the robot of that year. And that code will allow all of the robot's mechanisms to do all of the various tasks it needs to do for the competition, such as driving, picking up objects, and being able to score them. It's really important because it's basically what turns the hunk of metal that is our robot into something that can drive around the field, be controlled from a game controller, and sometimes even move uh, without any driver input, which is called autonomous. Programming is a pretty interesting process because in order to get the actual code on the robot, it's pretty reliant on having an actual robot. But there's a lot of things that programmers can do before we have our new design fabricated. And that involves a lot of research and a lot of testing for complex things such as computer vision to prepare for the season ahead. So a big part of programming in the first few weeks is identifying the challenges along with the rest of the team and figuring out what programming solutions can we use to either make those challenges easier to solve or to make the robot functional. Some of these things include identifying what tasks we will need to complete autonomously at the start of the match and what other things we can use to make the driver control more effective. There's a big library created by the Worcester Polytechnic Institute called WPI Lib. It's the primary programming library, which is essentially a set of uh, functions and different uh, classes that allow us to control the robot. And it's designed to be paired specifically with our competition's electronics and mechanisms. And in conjunction with that, we use a whole bunch of different code resources from different manufacturers and from different companies that create the products that we put on our robot. For this year's game, there's actually, fortunately, a lot of programming specific uh, challenges that are relatively unique. We have to be very particular in how we pick them up and how we place them down. So what that enables for programming for this season is to really rely heavily on computer vision to make our robot more accurate. 
We have a tool called the Limelight, which is a camera that um, has some built-in software to help detect objects, and specifically to detect reflective tape. And we use that to align the robot with the scoring panels in order to place the objects accurately. Another big part of this year's game is balancing at the end of the game. And that's another, st that's another stage where programming can really come in handy to have the robot automatically balance itself using sensors like gyroscopes and also using uh, algorithms such as PID in order to make sure the robot moves safely but also moves very effectively. The work we're doing is both a combination of training the new members to prepare them for future seasons and also preparing for this year's competition. And in that way, programming, like the rest of robotics work, is a multi-year process as we get to prepare things for this competition and we get to teach new students how to explore engineering, how to explore programming, and to have a lot of fun in robotics. Sparky went on to compete in two regionals, the Central Valley Regional and the Silicon Valley Regional. At the Central Valley Regional, due to the efforts of the awards team and of outreach, Team 840 won the Engineering Inspiration Award, qualifying Sparky to compete at the World Championship in Houston, the first time the team has gone to Worlds in a decade. Every step of creating a robot is integral to the final result, and is not possible without extremely dedicated members that are willing to put in several hours of their free time in order to make their plans into a reality. Sparky is not just a robot. It is also a reflection of the people who made it, and of their genuine desire to spread good in the world through STEM. This is Team 840, Aragon High School's FRC team. Take the red pill or you take off your you jacket. Take off Tell me, programming lead of this year's robotics competition, what the hell is programming? <laughs> Alright, we're recording for a little bit so that you guys can see this angle, bro. I don't know if you guys want to like lean in when you take the interview or like <laughs> Is that fine? <laughs> that is absolutely fine. Really? We're, we're gonna do that, you want yeah. It? Design! Stop padding circles for us to build. It's too hard. But once you take off your jacket and man's is no longer you hot. now have the memory <laughs> of a jacket. Huh? One more thing, and this is entirely your choice. You prefer you to have masks off so that people can see your voice and so that your voice can come through. See your voice. This is the height of innovation. We've been contacted by the head of innovation. That's like two feet off the ground. <laughs> yeah, Mark and uh, Mark and Musk are already calling. Mark and Musk. I got it. Bill, Bill Gates slipped into my DM, bro. <laughs> <laughs> We're not magic. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Contrary to popular belief. <laughs> so why did you join up on Because I was lonely. Wasn't you find a girlfriend? Absolutely. Yeah! <laughs> and fundamentally, man's is not hot. Because if man's was hot... What are you guys doing? Okay, I'll see you What's the password? What? Zero. No one's gonna try to break into that. <laughs> Just make that shit zero, 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 girl. <laughs> recording you, by the way. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's go! Let's go! If my, if my, get this on camera. Yeah. If my tongue had fingers, it would be pointing the middle one up. <laughs> <laughs> Symbolism. Round one. Fight. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> and if he knows all of tree, 
that he knows all of life. His butt ends with the tree. The omnipresent. Life ends with tree. Exactly. Yes. Get in, 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 get in